The first stage of the first class mage exam has ended, with Freerin and Fern managing to pass with their respective teams. In this video, we will witness more intense battles as the participants face a very difficult challenge inside a daunting dungeon. Get ready for an exciting story peppered with poignant flashbacks here and there. Let's get started. We see Fern pouting again, while Freerin is tying her hair. On the outskirts of town, Stark is meditating with a man beside him. The man complimented Stark, saying that he had done well to finally realize the real meaning of battle and that this is the true state of enlightenment. The man left and said that he had nothing more to teach Stark. Freerin arrived and asked who the old man was, so Stark replied that he was just a stranger who approached him while he was training, leading Freerin to comment that Stark is popular with weirdos. Freerin then asked for his assistance if possible, prompting Stark to ask what was wrong. They went back to the inn, where we see Fern pouting. Stark commented that she was insanely angry and asked what the heck Freerin had done. Freerin explained that she was in charge of shopping today, but totally overslept. Stark said that she does that all the time, so why was Fern like this after so long? Freerin explained that Fern is like a ticking time bomb. She will ignore you if she explodes. Freerin then asked Stark again to help her, but Stark said that he didn't want to and was scared. Freerin just accepted it and apologized for asking the impossible. When Stark decided to talk to Fern about Freerin already reflecting on her wrongdoing, Fern suddenly said that she wanted to eat snacks, puzzling Stark. Stark commented in his mind that Fern's a pain. Stark then decided that they should all buy some, while Freerin wondered if she still had some secret savings left. In the next scene, we see Kane at a bridge, where she saw Werble and Sharf talking to a man, pointing out that the man is a warrior, which puzzled the man. Suddenly, Werble walked away, saying that it's not happening with that guy. Kane wondered what Werble was doing. La Wine then arrived, apologizing for keeping Kane waiting. Kane commented that she was even cuter than usual, so La Wine explained that her older brothers had returned from the royal capital, and they kept buying her too many clothes every single time, and her mom was like that too. Kane pointed out that La Wine gets pampered even more than she does, so La Wine commented that if that's what Kane thinks, they should try to switch places. She added that always being compared to her exalted older brothers has been absolute hell. After that, La Wine said that they should leave, whereupon Kane suddenly knelt down, saying that it seems she is La Wine's escort for the day. Because of that, La Wine started pulling her hair again. In the next scene, we see Fern, Stark, and Freerin inside a bakery. Stark asked Fern which should they go with, to which Fern said that it doesn't matter to her and Stark may choose. Inside his mind, Stark was thinking that that is one of those moments when all of them are bad. Stark then asked Freerin what should they do, but Freerin is just as lost as he is. While thinking what to do, Kane and La Wine arrived at the same bakery. They saw Freerin and Kane explain that it was a perfect timing because she was thinking to visit her at the inn to hang out. After that, they all went together to tour the town. Stark asked who those two women were, to which Freerin replied that they were her companions in the second party. Kane commented that Freerin had helped them greatly and was like a teacher to them, to which Freerin explained that it was because those two were always arguing. Stark then said to himself that it doesn't feel right to only be surrounded by girls. Suddenly, Werble and Sharf showed up and called Stark a warrior, puzzling him. The two then started touching Stark's body and after that, Werble commented that he's pretty damn fine, making him scream. Werble explained that they've undertaken a subjugation quest from the Continental Magic Association for a fresher lion boar that's been laying waste to crops, so they've been searching for a vanguard. Werble remembered Fern from the exam and asked if he could borrow Stark, to which Fern quickly said, take her away, prompting Stark to comment how heartless she is. Kane then asked Fern if it's okay for Stark to be taken away, so Fern explained that it should be because Werble did not bear any malicious intent, almost as if he was someone else entirely. And La Wine also commented that doesn't that just mean he acts differently when he's working like her older brothers? After that, they went to the inn where Freerin's party are staying, and Kane gave Freerin a token of gratitude. Freerin explained that he hasn't done anything that warrants one, so Lawine and Kane explained that that's not true and if not for Freerin, 
they wouldn't have been able to advance to the second exam. Freerin remembered something, and we go back to the time where the hero party saved a little girl from a monster. The little girl thanks Himmel for his help. Freerin then asked him why does he help people, and he answered that because he's a hero. Freerin said that she doesn't mean that, so Himmel explained that it's probably just to satisfy himself, and he probably just wants someone to remember who he was, even if only a little. He added that the purpose of life is to be known and remembered. Freerin then wondered what should one do to be remembered, so Himmel explained further that only a little, you just need to change someone's life. After that, while listening to Kiane and others, Freerin smiled. She then felt relieved seeing Fern finally brightened up while eating the sweets they received. Lawine asked that didn't Freerin woke up pretty late on the second morning, causing Fern to pout again. So Freerin instructed Hiro to not talk about it because Fern's going to get into a terrible mood again if that happens. Lawine then commented that if their first class exam unfolds like past years, then there will be a third exam as well which means they will be rivals starting next time, to which Freerin agreed. Suddenly, a bird knocked on their window while carrying a letter. Fern opened the letter, and it appears to be a notice regarding the second exam stating where and when it will be held, as well as the name of the proctor in charge. When Lawine saw that since was the proctor, he commented that it's unlucky, prompting Fern to ask what does she mean. Lawine then explained that since has proctored four exams in the past, and each time, Nobody passed. After that, we seen Dinkin, Werbel, Scharf, Richter, Lafin, and the other examinees getting their notice letter as well. We then see Jano and Sense talking, and Jano commented that Sense exam requirements are cruel, to which Sense explained that she is a pacifist unlike him. We also see Stark and Werbel enjoying their food after their subjugation in here. Werbel was commenting how good of a warrior is Stark, and he now witnessed the real meaning of battle. Time passed, and we went to the northern countries, outside the tomb of the ruined king. The examinees gathered there, and since, the second exam proctor, explained the details of the second exam. The exam is a labyrinth dungeon raid, with the examinees raiding the tomb of the ruined king. The only condition to pass is to reach the innermost depths of the tomb. Since explained that she is a pacifist and doesn't like fighting. Therefore, everyone who reaches it will pass. Saatama, I mean Blay, commented that the dungeon had been tried by countless adventurers but had never been fully explored, asking if she intended to fail everyone again. Since told him they're aiming to become the ultimate mages. First class mages make the impossible possible. Even if it may have never been fully explored or conquered, they will push on to subdue it. Method then wondered how they would prove that they had reached the innermost depths, to which Sense explained there was no need to prove it, as she would be venturing to the innermost part as well, but she would not assist any examinees. She then proceeded to give them a bottle that the first class mage Lernan developed. She explained that it is a golem used for escape, so if they break the bottle, a golem will appear and carry them out of the dungeon. She added that it is still experimental but reasonably safe. Since further explained that if they use it, they will fail, and instructed them to use it if they deem it impossible to continue, as she doesn't permit people with promising futures to die. She also added that at dawn tomorrow, those bottles will break on their own, symbolizing that there will be a time limit for the second exam. After that, she announced the start of the exam, and the examinees began their strategies and observations on how to finish the dungeon. Richter saw that there were multiple entrances, and Dinkin commented that the dungeon looked like it was from the Unified Dynasty era. He explained that the dungeons of this era may have multiple entrances, but they all connect to the innermost depths. When he suggested dividing the labor of investigating the entrances, Tone asked why they would be cooperating, to which Dinkin explained that there was no competitive factor in this exam, so everyone should work together. Tone then said that wouldn't be happening and argued that. Unlike the first exam, the survival of their comrades was not a condition to pass. Even if they formed a party, there was no obligation to help their comrades, so there was a risk of them becoming sacrificial pawns if it ever came down to it. He added that even more so in Dinkin's case, since he seemed familiar with dungeons. After that, Tone decided to go inside alone. Kanye and Lawine were still talking about their plan, 
while the 17th party from the first exam decided to go inside. Werbel commented that there were still the bonds of the first exam to consider, and he refused to group up with anyone he wasn't familiar with, then proceeded to tell Sharf that they should go. Er then shouted, Hey, wait up. Dinan commented that they failed to see the significance of cooperation. Freerin instructed Fern that they should go, prompting Fern to ask if she was sure. Freerin explained that it was hopeless and nothing more would come of it. Since noticed them and decided to accompany them because she believed it was the safest way to reach the innermost depths. Freerin told her not to get in the way, to which Sense replied that she wouldn't interfere or help. While walking inside the dungeon, Freerin said their way was the safest route, instructing Fern and Sense to carefully progress while mapping the way. Freerin pointed out that one specific tile on the floor was a trap, so they should be careful. Fern commented on how experienced Freerin was with dungeons, to which Freerin explained that wasn't true in the past, and it was only because Himmel liked dungeons. She said they ventured into innumerable dungeons for monster subjugation quests. When Fern asked what she meant when she said Himmel liked dungeons, Freerin answered that it was exactly as it sounded, and he would get excited about them. You must not get it then. We then go back to the time when the hero party was in a dungeon similar to their exam. Aizen informed them that the stairs in front of them should lead to the next floor. Himmel realized they had taken the wrong route and decided to return to the fork they had passed earlier. Aizen then asked, Why? Our goal's the monster at the innermost depths. To which Himmel replied, When will you ever learn, Aizen? He explained that one couldn't truly progress through a dungeon unless they had explored every nook and cranny on a floor, pointing out that that was just common sense for adventurers prompting Aizen to argue that he had never heard of such common sense before. Himmel noticed Freerin looking at them, so he thought Freerin was thinking they were fools. He then asked if it wasn't best to have fun while helping people, to which Freerin answered that it wouldn't always be like that because as their journey progressed, they would encounter more life-threatening dungeons. Himmel then commented that he would continue to have fun until the very end, going on fun adventures, exploring dungeons, defeating monsters, seeking out treasure, and then finally realizing you actually saved the world. He said that was the kind of journey he wanted to lead. He added that, besides, a rare grimoire might lie at the end of a different path, prompting Freerin to become more enthusiastic about their dungeon raid, saying that they should hurry now. We then go back to the present, where she's saying that Fern really doesn't get it, all the while smiling. At the entrance of the dungeon, Dinkin, Richter, Lawfin, Kane and Lawine are still there. Not long after, Lawine invited Kane to go now, which she did. That left the 13th party, with Method and Lang. Dinkin said to Richter that if they had all cooperated and divided the labor, they would have had a reasonable possibility of conquering the dungeon. He added that he thought the people gathered there were skilled enough to realize that. Richter then argued that not everyone can agree with that like he can, and Dinkin had said so himself at the end of the first exam. It would have rubbed them the wrong way. He added that Dinkin should just think of their situation like they were left with the more intelligent people. He added again that, at the very least, there weren't any fools there who would fall for a simple trap such as a mimic and then hold their teammates back. After that, Dinkin decided to go with it while commenting as if such a fool would ever take that exam. We then go to Freerin, Fern, and since, finding a treasure chest inside the dungeon. Freerin felt mana inside the chest, so she thought there was probably a grimoire inside it. Fern then pointed out that she had already seen the results of Mikhite, the treasure chest analysis magic, and said that chest was a mimic. Freerin then argued that that spell is only 99% accurate, prompting Fern to ask what her point was. She then said that the greatest discoveries of all time were made because of the great mages who saw through the final 1%. Freerin continued to say that there was a precious grimoire inside, and her veteran mage senses were tingling. Fern gave a reluctant look, and it was revealed that the chest was really a mimic, and Freerin was again eaten by it. Freerin shouted that it was dark and scary. Because of that, Fern decided to help and tried to pull Freerin out of the mimic, while Sense thought that she probably chose the wrong people to follow. We then go to Dinkin and the others. Dinkin noticed something on the floor and ceiling, 
so he instructed his companions not to step on the floor in the middle because the ceiling would come crashing down. While continuing, they stumbled upon gargoyles and got ready for battle. Before long, they defeated the monsters, but suddenly, Lang got isolated and was brought to a room with spiked walls caving in. Dinkin tried to use his light magic to penetrate the closed door to save Lang, but it was no use. Because it was inevitable, Dinkin instructed Lang to break her bottle. She did that, and a huge golem appeared and saved her from the room. The golem carried her and went outside the dungeon. One of us had to abort already, huh? Dinkin commented, realizing that the slightest inattention would be their downfall, and that must be why the dungeon is called the Tomb of the Ruined King. We go back to Freerin and Fern, where Fern is trying to pull Freerin out of the Mimic's mouth. Freerin instructed Fern to stop pulling for a second because she was going to get torn apart, to which Fern complied. Freerin explained that at times like those, Fern should thrust her deeper in instead, and the Mimic would gag and stop biting. Fern proceeded to do that, and she managed to save Freerin from the Mimic. Fern then asked Freerin how she dealt with them when she was alone, so Freerin explained that she would blow them up internally with offensive magic, but then her hair would be blown up as well, so she'd rather not. So the reason why your hairstyle would sometimes change was because of that then. After that, they continued their journey to the innermost part of the dungeon. They saw another treasure chest, and inside that, they found a medallion, prompting Fern to say that they had seen that medallion all over the place, to which Freerin said that she thinks some connoisseur may have been collecting them. When Freerin noticed that their path was correct, they instructed Fern and sensed to head back, puzzling Fern. They saw another mimic, but Fern quickly saved her now as she knew how to deal with that kind of problem. While walking, Fern commented that the exam was going surprisingly well, so Freerin said that it was certainly strange for an uncharted dungeon and architecturally speaking, they should be closing in on its deepest points soon. Freerin then decided they should take a break, and it was revealed that she had found many things, prompting Fern to comment that they simply looked like useless trinkets. Since then called Fern's attention and said that she was confused, to which Fern agreed and added that to see Freerin happy with such things was puzzling. Since then pointed out that she meant she was confused about Fern. She said that she had never met any mage as talented as her at that age, so she must have gone through significant training. She added that, in spite of that, she could feel no passion or tenacity coming from her, labeling her as a strange girl. Fern then explained that she became a full-fledged mage to repay someone special for his kindness. That was her life's goal at the time, and she poured all her heart into it, never conceiving the possibility of a future beyond. She added that she must have exhausted all her passion and tenacity back then. Since then asked if, in that case, why does she continue her pursuit of magic? Fern commented that Freerin appears to be having fun, to which Sense agreed. She then added that even when she first ventured into a dungeon, she witnessed Freerin smiling, as she seems to be happy gathering magical items that looked like useless trinkets. Her smile spread to me. She added that she's sure she is accompanying her pursuit of magic because she likes seeing Freerin that way. Since smiled and commented that it seems it was the right decision to join them after all. She's sure that with them, she could even enjoy a cruel dungeon like that. We then go to Werble and his companions. Scharf noticed that the atmosphere had changed, and Werble said that perhaps the deepest point was nearby. Era then called to Werble, and it looked like she had been restrained. She informed them that there were three mages who had hidden their mana, and it was an ambush. Suddenly, attacks came from the side, but Werble managed to defend. Werble pointed out that the magic binding error was Sogany, a target binding magic. He then instructed Scharf to obstruct the vision of their enemy, so he created a wall made from flowers. So this is why the tomb of the ruined king was impregnable, to think such beings existed here. We then saw what appeared to be their clones. Werbel instructed that Scharf would take on his clone, while Er would handle Scharf's clone, and he himself would tackle Er's clone. In another part of the dungeon, Dinkin managed to defeat the clone of Lothin. He commented that it appeared to be a clone made from magic, and it must have been the work of a demon or monster. He added that, however, he had never seen such a flawless clone in his life. 
Its mana and skill were on par with La Fen's, and its behavior as well, and it may even be making use of her memories, prompting La Fen to say that that wasn't really something to feel good about. Richter then commented that, assuming they were working with allies, it would be easy to tell who an imposter was at a single glance, so at the very least, there was no risk of friendly fire. Method argued that if they assumed that the one, or ones, using that magic were to control several clones at a single time, it would certainly become a terrifying threat. Dinkin then said that, in any case, it was the right decision for them to work in teams, as it provided them with more means to deal with the clones. After that, they went inside a room and saw another clone. Richter then asked if they would be able to deal with that clone too, to which Dinkin said that the only thing he could say was, if that were not an exam, his bottle would have long been broken already. It was then revealed that the clone was none other than Freerin's clone. Clone Freerin charged and attacked, and Dinkin quickly instructed the others to retreat for now. In a room, Jano was talking to the glasses man from the start of the first selection exam, and he explained here that they call the master of the dungeon where the exam was happening Spiegel or the reflective water demon. It's a demon from a mythical era that is recounted in Sage Uig's heroic tales. It is believed to read the memories of those who enter its dungeon and then generate clones of their targets. In their modern day, it would be a demon that bears similarities to Ice Sam, the phantom demon, but Spiegel produces physical bodies, perfect clones that have replicated their original strength, mana, and even techniques. He then said that this is the reason why the Tomb of the Ruined King remains uncharted to this day. The Glasses Man asked Jano why Sense chose that dungeon as the grounds for the exam, to which Jano explained that the clones are essentially mirrors of themselves, so in order to defeat them without casualties, the examinees would have to calmly reflect upon themselves while also working as a team. It is truly the kind of exam a pacifistic girl would employ. We then see Yubel seeing a dead end, and it was revealed that they had been cornered along with Land by her clone. The Yubel clone managed to injure Land and take his bottle of escape. Yubel asked Land if he had an idea how to handle clones, being an expert at doppelganger magic himself. How perfect of a clone do you think it is? Yubel asked, to which Land commented that the thing about Yubel is, even in the heat of battle, she is quite talkative, as if she'd die if she had to shut up. Yubel realized that he had been observing her closely and answered that she probably would. She then pointed out that her clone is quiet, which might imply that it hasn't copied her memories or personality, to which Land said that it's probably just not talking. He explained that when the clone initially attacked, it ripped out the escape golem bottle stowed near his chest. Yubel then commented that knowing herself, she'd certainly do that, so it seems the clone has knowledge about them as well. Land also realized that for it not to come attacking despite cornering them would mean that it is being careful about Yubel Salgany, her target binding magic. Yubel then said, that, or it just likes to toy around with people, to which Land said, which isn't funny, is it? Yubel then noticed Land losing a lot of blood and pointed out that he wouldn't last long like that, to which Land agreed. Yubel then asked if the land she was with was the real land, prompting Land to answer, who knows, one can only wonder. Yubel then offered her bottle to Land to use it, but Land argued that it was meant for her own survival. Yubel smiled and placed the bottle in front of Land. She then got up and said that Land should just wait, and she would be back for the bottle. Land tried to talk to her, but Yubel quickly charged at her clone. She noticed that the clone was closing its distance to avoid being targeted by her Sogany, and that too was what she was doing because if one of them misread that distance first, they would lose. She concluded that if their strength was on par, then the outcome would boil down to luck, and she hated contests based on luck since it had never been kind to her, which was why she would never fathom fighting herself. She commented that she guessed death was inevitable. The clone managed to dodge her attack, but after gaining distance, it used Salgany on Yubel. Yubel commented that it seemed she didn't have much luck after all and that was why she hated that sort of thing. She added that, however, it looked like the clone had even less luck than she did. Land then appeared behind the clone, prompting Yubel to comment that that was surprisingly fast. Because the clone got distracted by Land, Yubel managed to land a killing blow, making them win the battle. After that, 
Yubel took the golem bottle and noticed that it was fake. Lan pointed out that Yubel knew that the him who was on the verge of death was a doppelganger and asked why she was in such a hurry to die. Yubel then said because she believed that four eyes would come to her rescue. Do I seem like such a nice guy? Land asked, to which Yubel answered, Nope, not in the slightest. Or more like that's irrelevant. Yubel then pointed out that Land didn't take her bottle, so she thought that he must hate it when people died because of him. She said that was why she set up a situation where she would die because of Land. She then proceeded to thank Land and commented that it felt like she was one step closer to him now. Land then said that he was happy to hear that and asked if she would be able to sympathize with him soon, to which Yubel answered that she thought it would take some more time. We then go to Freern, Fern, and since arriving at the same room where Din Ken and his companions had retreated, Freerin asked why they were gathered in a place like that, to which Dinkin explained that from a structural standpoint, if they got past that large hall, they would reach the deepest part of the dungeon. Freerin then asked what the problem was, so Dinkin pointed at her clone, saying that it had been stationed there for half a day now. While looking at her clone, Freerin commented that it looked like it would finally get exciting, and that was what dungeon raids should be all about. Freerin added that it seems to possess the same power as her. Dinkin asked if she had any idea how to beat that and reach the deepest part. Freerin explained that if that thing was a replica, then its weakness would likely be the same as hers, the original living mage. Richter suggested that they use restraint magic or hypnosis magic, but Freerin said it was resistant to both, to which Dinkin argued that still, those might give them a small opening, and he believed that Freerin could defeat the clone so long as they could attain that opening. Dinkin pointed out that Method's forte was in restraint or hypnosis magic if he wasn't wrong. Method hugged Freerin to try restraining her, but it didn't work, and she explained that usually, it should work if the difference in mana wasn't immense. Method then tried to look at Freerin eye to eye, but hypnosis magic also didn't work as she couldn't penetrate her mental defense. She then explained that despite the complex and robust mental defense system, Freerin's technique seemed to be a rather ancient one and added that someone who specialized in mental magic might be able to penetrate any vulnerability. When Dinkin asked if she knew someone, she said it might be possible with Edel, a second-class mage. She then said, however, unlike Method, her capability in battle was practically non-existent, so it was a question of whether or not she would really make it to where they were. She added that in principle, hypnosis magic would not work on an enemy if they do not possess a mind. So whether or not the clone had truly replicated her to that point. It seems that we still lack details, Dinkin commented. In a hall inside the dungeon, we see Edel, Blay, and Dunst. It was revealed that they were running away from the clone of Sense. Blay asked what that thing was, so Edel answered that who knows, but it wouldn't be wrong to think that it had the same powers as Sense. Blay then said that they had no choice but to defeat it because even masking mana and hiding had its limits. Edel argued, Do you even think we can defeat it, Blay? She added that Blay and Dunst couldn't even fight decently inside that dungeon. Dunst explained that modern magic was not suitable for dungeon battles, to begin with, to which Edel replied that that's the result of almost every dungeon being conquered during the era when they subjugated the Demon King. And since too many resources were harvested to fuel their powerful defense magic, offense magic would often manipulate nature now. She added that instead of materializing something from nothing, manipulating what exists nearby and changing it expends much less mana. However, that thing is fairly skilled at that field. She explained that clone since his hair was imbued with several layers of magic, so they could assume that it had countless ways to fight inside the dungeon, so in her opinion, they could not defeat it. Magic is the world of visualization. The ability to freely alter threads that are so incredibly numerous, like uncountable strands of hair, since the moment it possessed an inhuman visualization of that sort, it had been a mage that was far superior to them. Dunst then commented that, to begin with, they are not fighters, so that appeared to be the right time, to which Edel added, and frankly, she just wanted to go home now since she was scared. Lay then asked her, wouldn't your voice reach it? So Edel explained that hypnosis magic is certainly the lifeblood of her family, but it wouldn't be possible to get clone sense to fulfill the conditions of any complex order. 
She added that what's possible at best may be to cause it to kneel and give them an opening, but she'd still need to make a contact and speak with it. So it isn't impossible then, Blay replied, to which Edel said, if it has a mind, that is. When Dunst asked how much time Edel needed, Edel answered that she needed 15 seconds, or more like that's the most they'd get, prompting Blay to ask what she meant. Edel answered that he was about to find out. Suddenly, Clone Sense noticed them and quickly sliced the pillars around them. Clone Sense managed to find them, so Edel quickly used full sphere defense magic. While Clone Sense was attacking, Edel explained that in modern battles of magic, there are two ways to penetrate defense magic, overwhelm it with mass to shatter it, or use techniques to slip past it. People who focus on quantity generally attack relying on the latter. After explaining, Clone Sense's attack managed to penetrate her defense, shocking her. She commented that her hair felt as heavy as a massive boulder. Not long after, Clone Sense managed to break her full barrier. She thought that a full sphere defense would last 15 seconds, but she was wrong. Fortunately, Adele managed to make eye contact with the clone, and she explained that the more superior a mage is, the clearer the vision they have of their enemy. Adele tried to command Clone Sense to kneel, but it didn't work. Because of that, Adele got injured by Clone Sense, and she realized there that the clone didn't have a mind and was just imitating the actions of the host's mind exactly. Dunst tried to attack Clone Sense to protect Adele. Edel commented that they had no choice but to piggyback and use all their might to flee to where the fighters were. Edel decided to use hers to head back as she didn't want to get hurt anymore. When Clone Sense tried to attack Edel after she broke the Golem bottle, the Golem managed to defend her. Blay then said to Dunst that they should run now. We then go back to Freerin and the others. Freerin suggested that it was best to assume that the clone did not have a mind but that meant it would boil down to raw power. Dinkin asked her if she could handle it, to which she answered she didn't know. Fern then said that if that was the case, then she might be capable of killing Freerin. Freerin smiled and invited them to formulate a strategy. Not long after, Dunst managed to get to them and explained that they were attacked by Sense's clone, so Adele retreated. He then said that he had intel and asked if cooperation was out of the question to which Dinkin said that that was what he had wanted in the first place, and then looked for someone there who could heal. Method had her scriptures, so she started to heal Dunst. Dunst then told them that the clones do not possess a mind and, according to Edel's judgment, are simply imitating the actions of the host's minds exactly, and do not seem to possess minds of their own. When Freerin suggested that they must formulate a strategy with that in mind, Dinkin argued that there were still too many unknown variables. The biggest issue was Freerin's clone and the true identity of its summoner, so they could not take action until they understood their nature. Richter then said that in particular, they were not truly certain whether or not the clone had any weaknesses, and if they presumed that the clone was as powerful as Freerin, then there would most likely be casualties. He then looked at Sense, prompting Sense to say that she wouldn't give any clues. Lawine and Kanne then arrived, stating that the clone doesn't have any weaknesses and the one controlling the clones is a demon from a mythical era called Spiegel, the reflective water demon. Dinkin asked how she knew that, so she explained that her eldest brother was a member of the advance party sent from the Continental Magic Association to raid the tomb of the ruined king. Richter commented that no wonder the two girls managed to get that far, they had some intel. Richter added that, however, that made absolutely no sense. If that were the case, Lawine and Kane should have shared their intel and cooperated with them in the first place, to which the two girls argued that it didn't even seem like they could cooperate, and by the time they realized it, Freerin and Fern had already gone ahead. They then pointed out that he was the middle-aged man who tried to kill them and asked if Richter thought they could cooperate that easily, to which Richter smirked. Lawine then explained that according to the advance party's observations, Spiegel should be inside the treasury that lies beyond the door from where the clone stands. They said that its main body is a frail monster and capable of attacking, so if they can defeat it, the clones should all disappear. Dinkin then commented that her intel seemed to coincide with the results of his mana detection. The main body is beyond the door where the clone stands, but the door has a powerful seal on it, 
to which Freerin agreed since her clone was the one who made it. The name of the seal is Sacrificial Treasury Door Lock Magic. She explained that the door will not open until its caster perishes. She added that they could also avoid the door entirely by tearing open a path through the walls, but chances are, that's been protected against already. Dinkin commented that, one way or another, to strike Spiegel, they would need to defeat the clone. LaWine explained that if they're going to take it down, they need to hurry because Spiegel is the one who created all of the clones in the dungeon, and those clones have a habit of gathering at the deepest point where they are in no time. She added that with the previous advance party, practically everyone, aside from her older brother's unit, met their demise precisely where they are, just before the deepest point. Fern then asked if she was right in thinking that the clones are imitating the actions of the host's minds exactly. She added that if this is the case, then the weaknesses in their behavior would be the same as those of the hosts. To this, Dunst replied, chances are. Fern then concluded that in that case, they may just have a way of dealing with their enemy, prompting Freerin to ask what that weakness would be. Fern asked Freerin to stand next to a wall, to which she did. Suddenly, Fern used her magic on Freerin with incredible speed. After that, it was revealed that Freerin managed to defend against it, shocking method and Din Kin and making them realize something. Fern commented that it looks like Din Kin and Method noticed it. Lawine and Kane, on the other hand, didn't get it. Dinkin then commented that this is certainly a fatal vulnerability for Freerin, and he wondered why it failed to catch his attention when he fought her before. He explained that the instant a spell is cast, her mana detection is interrupted for a mere fraction of a second. Lofen commented, isn't that a common error for apprentice mages, prompting Freerin to explain that it's been a weak point for her since ages ago. Fern then asked if she were personally aware of it, why did she not mention it? So Freerin admitted that it's embarrassing. Richter argued that still, her other abilities are simply too extraordinary. There are almost no mages in existence who could realistically exploit that vulnerability. Fern then said that in that case, they should hold a strategy meeting. So, they started discussing what they were going to do and how they could defeat Fern's clone. Fern noticed that Freerin seemed to be enjoying their situation, to which Freerin agreed. We then go back to a time where the hero party is battling a huge monster. Himmel commented that it seemed they had reached a verdict and suggested that they would have Aizen grab the enemy's attention while they flanked it, and Freerin would provide covering fire. When Freerin asked what Hyder would do, Himmel explained that today was a hangover day, so he was useless, and Aizen added that he was dead. After that, the hero party executed Himmel's strategy and faced the monster using their wits. We then go back to the present where Freerin explained that she was just reminiscing about how they, the hero party, often discussed how to defeat dungeon bosses like they were doing now. They then continued their planning and not long after, they finished. They all got up, and Freerin asked, Shall we begin the raid? Dinkin then asked if she thought they could win, to which Freerin replied that it would be fine and dungeons that cannot be conquered do not exist. And that's coming from the mage of the party that conquered the most dungeons in all of history, after all. Dinkin then asked her if she was sure it would be all right to leave her and Fern to fight the clone, to which Freerin explained that it would be easier to predict its movements with fewer people. She further explained that it is true that if they were to fight it together, Victory would be practically guaranteed, but she believed the majority of them would perish, and there likely wouldn't be any time for them to summon the escape golem. Richter then asked if she believed it was crucial for the rest of them to hold back the clones that would assemble there in the deepest part, to which Freerin answered yes, since they would be eradicated if they got cornered on both ends. After that, they proceeded as planned, and Dinkin wished them an exceptional fight. Dinkin then started their discussion on which of them would be easy targets. Inside the room, an exciting battle quickly started, and Freerin and her clone both used destructive lightning magic Jidrigalem. Fern, on the other hand, was trying to move out of the clone's line of sight while thinking it was going as Freerin had predicted. The two then cast Hell's Inferno magic, Wolves Anvil, and a burst of flame clashed. Freerin noticed while going to the other side that the mana detection of her clone was interrupted, and it was now on the lookout for Fern, who took that opportunity to hide. However, its hands were already full with an enemy that was its equal, 
so it likely wouldn't have time to look for Fern. The clone suddenly appeared in front of Freerin and was ready to attack. Freerin commented in her mind that in the end, she was the one who knew her fears best. We then have a flashback to where they were discussing their plan. Freerin said to Fern that it would be fine, and even she would have difficulty detecting Fern once she completely concealed herself. Fern then asked, but is Soul Track, ordinary offense magic, truly enough for an attack? To which Freerin said it was because it was the quickest to cast. She added that besides, Soul Track was a relatively new spell for elves, so she hadn't built up enough experience over the years to automatically defend against it using pure reflexes. No matter what, a counter to it would be delayed for the moment spent in thought, even if only for an instant, for the slightest flinch. She then said that it was a different situation for Fern. For her, she had been a natural at Soul Track since birth. She added that Fern's body was engraved with the foundations of a natural mage. Fern's soul track will be able to kill me. Fire at me with all the magical power you have. We then saw Fern getting ready to cast soul track while Freerin kept her clone busy. In another flashback, we see Freerin giving a scroll to Siri that Flam instructed her to give. Siri commented that it had been a century since she last saw Flam and realized, so that's it. Flam had passed away. Freerin then asked her if that didn't sadden her, to which Siri explained that Flam was just a pupil she raised on a whim. Siri opened the letter and noted that it practically looked like a report. When Freerin asked what Flam had written, Siri explained that it seemed the Emperor had approved the research of magic countrywide. In human society, all forms of magic to that day had been deemed demonic techniques, and any open research had been considered taboo. She added that Flam was the one who influenced the Emperor, and she took part in educating the newly established Imperial Mages, and now she wanted Ciri to take over. Ciri commented that Flam was a greedy person because her research on magic had already been approved, and now she was asking for more. Freerin then asked, so that was an incredible accomplishment, to which Ciri explained that it meant the largest unified empire on the continent had begun researching magic, and using it for military affairs. The surrounding countries would not ignore that. In just a few decades, magic would take over the continent by storm. She added that an era had arrived in which all of mankind would be able to use magic. That meant that in the foreseeable future, mankind would acquire the power to oppose the Demon King. I see. That does sound incredible, truly, Freerin commented, to which Siri agreed. Siri then ripped Flam's letter and said that wasn't what she wanted. She questioned Flam's desire for an era in which anyone could use magic, explaining that magic was meant to be special, and she had no intention of teaching anyone who wasn't talented. To think she would get you to hand me something like this. In the end, Flam and I could never understand each other. Well, she was just a pupil I raised on a whim, after all. Freerin then said that Flam had said Siri would be infuriated and tear up the will, which caught Siri's attention. Freerin added that Flam wanted to tell Siri that her dream had come true. She then commented that she didn't really get it, though. Siri then looked at her, and not long after, Freerin decided to leave and said that she didn't think they would ever meet again. Siri then called Freerin back and asked if they could walk together before that happened arguing that after all, they had all the time in the world. They then did that and talked along the way. Siri explained that Flam's dream was an era in which anyone could use magic. She was sure that serving mankind and acquiring the power to oppose the Demon King's army were not the sorts of things that mattered to her initially. Siri then asked Freerin if she knew what Flam's favorite spell was, saying it was flowerbed making magic, a pointless spell that wasn't good for anything. She then explained that Flam truly loved magic. She genuinely hoped that everyone in the world could learn to use that sort of magic, and Siri found it revolting. It was just like a cute dream only little girls would have, but that was truly the case. Siri said that was a fantasy Flam would keep talking about when she was a little girl, much shorter than her. But frankly, Siri believed such an era would only happen far in the future and could thus never come true for Flam. She further explained that Flam's life was so transient as to be nearly non-existent next to hers, and yet she ascended to becoming the very founder of mankind's magic. Freerin then mentioned that her master, Flam, 
was always one to make decisions quickly, almost as if she were in a hurry for something. Because of that, Siri explained that humans have lifespans. They exist in a place far closer to death than Siri and Freerin are. There are many moments in life when people must make crucial decisions, but for those children, they cannot afford to postpone them. She added that for them, they could make decisions a century or two later, or even if they let any issue sit for a millennium, as their time is nearly infinite. She further explained to Freerin that a very long time has passed since humans established a semblance of a civilization. The era that begins now will rapidly advance. She then said that in a mere 1,000 years, elves will be overtaken by humans and advised Freerin not to neglect her training because if there's anyone who might kill her, it would be the demon king or a human mage. Freerin then said she was looking forward to that since she would be able to encounter tons of mages and all sorts of magic from now on. We then go back to Freerin and Fern's battle with Freerin's clone, where Fern cast her soul track. Her soul track managed to hit Freerin's clone, prompting Freerin to smile. Unfortunately, after the attack, it was revealed that the clone had managed to block it. Freerin followed up with her Hellflame magic and commented that things seemed to be progressing as expected, and they were going to be in a battle of attrition from here on out. Outside the room, we saw Richter and Lawine group together to face off against Lawine and Kanae's clones. We then go back to the time when Method figured out the exact location of the enemy clones, so Dink can relate it to the others. He said that they had no hope of winning if it turned into a melee, so they should split up and stop the clones before they could gather there. He added that they had confirmed which of them would be easy targets, and any easy targets among them should be easy targets among the clones as well. They had the benefit of communication and coordination, so if they properly chose their targets, they would be able to fight with a slight advantage. As we saw the matchups made, Denkin added that if there were any enemies that could not be defeated alone, they should outnumber them. Method then argued that there was one concern. The number of clones she could detect was slightly lower than the number of examinees, and she could not sense the presence of their greatest threat, since his clone. Freerin also said that she was unable to detect it as well, and they certainly could not overlook Sense's clone. If they were to be surrounded, she would not be able to protect Fern. In the worst case, the two of them might die. Method added that she couldn't locate Fern's or Dinkin's clones either, so they had no choice but to seek them out using more accurate close-range detection instead. Richter then pointed out Sense and said that they wouldn't need to deal with such a threat if she hadn't come with them to begin with. So since explained that first-class mages needed to be capable of overcoming unfathomable adversity, and that level wasn't even close to adversity. She added that moreover, they could only pass by covering their comrades' backs, so that was actually a generous and peaceful exam. Richter and Lawine managed to defeat the clones they were facing, but not long after, strands of hair impaled Lawine out of nowhere. It also broke Richter's defenses and managed to impale him too. It was revealed that since his clone had arrived at the scene, and Richter commented he hadn't even let his mana detection down, but it still managed to land a surprise attack. He then instructed Lawine to break her bottle as well, as she wasn't a brat who was too stubborn to realize when enough was enough. Lawine was forced to do it, so Richter explained that they could retake the exam three years later. Meanwhile, Dinkin quickly went to their location, but when he saw them being carried away by the golem, he realized he was too late. He also thought that even if he had been there, the result would likely have been the same. He then observed Sense's clone and thought that even though her back was in plain sight, he didn't sense even the slightest hint of an opening. Nonetheless, he needed to buy time. Yubel and Lan then arrived, and Yubel asked him how things were going, expressing doubt that he would win if he fought Sense's clone. Yubel then inquired if the fight was necessary to conquer the dungeon and told Din In to spare her the details, to which Din In confirmed it was necessary. In that case, I will defeat it, declared Yubel, prompting Lan to question what she was talking about. He pointed out that Din In was the strongest among them and that Yubel hadn't even been able to defeat Werbel. Yubel explained that she was indeed an inexperienced third-class mage and far weaker than Din In or Werbel. However, she believed she could win against Sense. She then demonstrated her magic and said that it was the magic she specialized in, Railsiden, 
or nigh unstoppable cutting magic. She could cut anything she believed she could cut, but nothing she believed she couldn't. So what? A spell like that would easily be blocked by defense magic, Land retorted. Yubel asked if he had witnessed her battle with Werbel and explained that it was true that defense magic was used to block magic. Hence, she couldn't really visualize cutting through it. Land argued that it wouldn't work against Sense. Based on his observations, Sense's hair was layered with several spells on par with defense magic. Yubel countered that his line of reasoning didn't matter in any way since it was all about visualization in the end. Land tried to stop her as she approached Sense's clone but to no avail. Yubel tried to use Saugany, but it didn't work. She commented that, since hair is still technically part of the body, it was impossible to get its entire body in her sight. She then quickly used her nigh unstoppable cutting magic, Rail Sidon. We then go to Sense, who thought she had expected Yubel to be her clone's opponent. She already knew the outcome and anticipated that it wouldn't be much of a fight. She then recalled how Yubel got disqualified during the second class mage selection exam two years ago. The proctor responsible for the second stage exam was Berg, a first class mage who specialized in defense and had never been scratched, not even once, since he became a first class mage. He possessed the so-called immovable cloak. The cloak he magically crafted was imbued with a defensive incantation that made it impervious to all forms of offensive magic. Sense explained that for the second stage exam, there was one simple criterion to pass. The examinee simply needed to fire an offensive spell at Berg with his cloak on and push him back a single step. The rules disqualified killing, which prompted a minimum level of control over one's offensive magic. It was a measure introduced to protect the other examinees. She added that nobody was really concerned about Berg's safety, yet a random girl who had just become a third-class mage cut him down like butter. Since talked to Yubel after that incident, asking her before leaving, how did you cut through his immovable cloak? To which Yubel replied, have you ever sewn before? This prompted Sense to answer that she had not. Because of that, Yubel concluded that Sense must come from a good family and asked if she made all of that with magic. She commented that it was sad, but she was poor at it, too so she had never sewn anything. She added that she used to often watch her older sister sew, explaining that when she cut through cloth, she would push the scissors in like that and then cut it across with a SC chage, enjoying the sound it made. Since then commented that she didn't see Yubel's point, prompting Yubel to explain that what she was talking about was visualization. She said that cloth is something that can be cut, something she should naturally be able to cut. At this time, since was thinking that Yubel was out of her mind. She thought that anyone could visualize themselves cutting cloth, and even a simpleton could do that. However, the world of magic isn't that simple. Something that cannot be perfectly visualized cannot be materialized through magic. Just like how a little ant cannot visualize itself crushing an enormous dragon. There simply aren't any mages out there who could bring themselves to visualize the act of cutting through Berg's cloak since it was protected by a defensive incantation like an impenetrable iron wall. She added that any mage would know at a glance that the cloak was genuinely impervious to every form of offensive magic. No one could possibly escape that constraint, not if they are a living being with any level of intelligence, yet Yubel simply followed her feelings. Even though she knew it was something that could not be cut, she visualized herself cutting up the immovable cloak through her feelings. Since said that she could no longer see Yubel as having the state of mind of a normal human being and said that this is the realm of intuition. Yubel then gave the scissors she had taken and asked if she could leave now, to which Sense agreed. Yubel then commented that Sense had some pretty hair and it would be a shame if someone were to trim it. Sense said that she probably lost to Yubel right from that very moment. She couldn't visualize herself beating Yubel, no matter what. They were simply too incompatible. We then see Yubel defeating Sense's clone in one fell swoop using her rail siden. In the next scene, we go to Werbel with Scharf, Error, and Method, where Method explained to Werbel their plan to buy time for Freerin and Fern to defeat Spiegel. Method then noticed that Sense's clone had been defeated and felt Yubel's mana, so she deduced that Yubel was the one who did it. When Scharf commented that it was a surprising outcome, Werbel said that the matchup was pretty off, 
and Method explained that a battle between mages is akin to a rock-paper-scissors match, albeit a rock-paper-scissors match that is extremely complex, difficult to read, and involves a myriad of moves. Werbel then realized that he would like to increase the number of available moves they have to defeat the enemy, so he agreed to help them hold back the clones. He explained that he's not the type to trust others, but he's not stupid enough to just let a winning horse that's shaking its backside get away either. Method explained that currently, there are two dangerous clones that absolutely must be stopped, and she has identified the location of one, which is Dinkin's clone. She asked Werbel and the others to take care of that, while she deals with Fern's clone because Fern is particularly skilled in masking her mana, so she would be able to concentrate on mana detection more easily alone. Air wondered if Method could really handle it alone because Fern is pretty strong, so Method explained that she is one of many talents and stopping someone is her forte. She added that she has already confirmed that restraint magic would work on it, as she has tested that on the real body. After that, they made their move. We go back to Dinkin, Yubel, and Land, and it seems that Yubel's clone came back, now accompanied by Land's clone. At their backs, La Wine, Kane, and La Fin's clones are getting ready to attack. Yubel asked if this meant that the battle would continue on until Spiegel was defeated, saying that if so, it's a war of attrition and it's going to be fun. We then see a montage in which each party made their move to stall the clones made by the Reflection Demon. At the deepest part, Freerin and her clone continued to battle. Because the opening she saw wouldn't work, she had no choice but to resort to another plan. We go back to the time where she, Fern, and Dinkin were planning something. Freerin asked Fern, just an opening for mana detection wouldn't be enough for us to kill it, would it? To which Fern agreed. Fern then said that she believed a greater opening would permit them victory. Freerin realized that she could beat it then so she decided to create the opening Fern wanted. Fern asked if she could really do that, to which Freerin explained that if she created an opening herself, it would create an even greater one in turn. When Fern expressed worry that Freerin would be hurt, Freerin said that if she concentrated on her defenses, it shouldn't be a fatal wound. And then the strategy in that situation is, surprise me, if Fern believes she can beat it, then she can. Fern asked how she could be so certain so Freerin explained that she had always underestimated Fern. Fern smiled and said that was a relief and that they now had a strong chance of winning. We go back to the battle, where clone Freerin used a blast of magic on the original Freerin. The attack managed to break Freerin's defenses and eventually hit her. When the clone tried to follow up with an attack, Fern used a blast of soul track to stop it. Unfortunately, the clone managed to defend against it, but not long after, its defenses broke, making Fern's attack land. The clone stood up as if the fatal injury it received had no effect. Suddenly, it used an unusual magic and looked at Fern, making her fly into the wall with such force that her staff also broke. Fern was puzzled, thinking about what happened and why she couldn't sense its mana at all and couldn't even perceive that attack as magic. She then commented that Freerin was really incredible and said, so this is the pinnacle of magic then. However, she noted that this was not like Freerin, as it was covered all over with openings. The original Freerin then came out of nowhere and shot clone Freerin at point-blank range using Soul Track, leading to the clone's defeat. Freerin praised Fern and said it had likely been 80 years since she was cornered to the point where she had to resort to that kind of magic, which made Fern smile. After that, the main body of the demon was revealed in the next room, and Freerin quickly defeated it. Because of that, all the clones that the others were battling disintegrated. Everyone then gathered in the next room and saw a huge pile of treasure. So this is the deepest part of the tomb of the ruined king, Dinkin commented. Since praised them for conquering the tomb and said it was a great achievement, sufficiently rivaling that of a first-class mages, which would now leave its mark in history. She then announced that as promised for reaching the deepest part, they all passed the second stage of the exam. Dinkin felt someone was missing, so he asked where their greatest achiever had disappeared off to, which led to them discovering Freerin stuck again inside a mimic. Because of that, Dinkin and La Fin had expressions of disbelief. After that, 
since announced that the second stage of the exam was now over. In the end, it was revealed that the golem from the bottle could use recovery magic too, impressing the examinees. And that's the end of the video. Please like and subscribe.